Welcome to the Gallery Talk. My name is Mark Swain. I'm the Chair of Art and Design here at Lewis University. And I'd like to welcome our two artists today, um, Denise Belezzo and David Bauer. Uh, Denise and David actually happen to be married. Um, they're celebrating their, their 32nd year anniversary. Um, they are both very prolific uh, professional Chicago artists. They're also both retired college professors um, at Morton College in Chicago and at Northern Illinois University in DeKalb. Um, a, a personal note and a special note, um, when I was personally getting my Master of Fine Arts at uh, NIU, uh, David Bauer was in charge of the uh, Drawing Foundations program and I was a, a, a beginning young uh, a drawing teacher and so I have uh, just nothing but gratitude towards David and um, how well he, he guided us uh, early teachers um, through the drawing program. Much actually much of what I do and I graduated in 1998, much of what I still do in my drawing class is from that program that, that uh, David uh, directed. So thank you, David, for that. Um, both Denise and David have shown extensively nationally and internationally um, their, their work as part of uh, uh, many important collections. And um, it's just astounding. Uh, Natalie Swain, the gallery director, and I had an opportunity to go to their home and their studio and it's just astounding the amount of work and how they immerse themselves uh, in their work, uh, not only here in, in, uh, in Illinois, but also uh, abroad as they go to various residencies throughout the world. So, um, you know, it's, we, we're lucky to have artists like David and Denise because it, it really lets the students see how, how much dedication to their, to their discipline um, they put into it. All you have to do is walk in the gallery and you're, you're looking at one show, but um, you really ha immediately have an appreciation for the, the time and the commitment um, that goes into this type of work. So welcome David and, and Denise. Uh, we just love having you. This is their uh, first uh, uh, two-person show, correct? But yeah. second time both of you have been to Lewis. Is that yes. correct? Yeah. Yes. So we're very lucky to have them back, and uh, boy, does the show um, show well as a two-person show. Um, they're 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 distinct and they're they're separate, but they they really sort of work well together. And and I think if you come to the show, you'll notice that. So our talk today is composed primarily of students um, student questions questions that were submitted by Lewis University students after walking through and looking at the show. Um, I'm going to alternate between uh, Denise and David. And uh, of course, Denise and David, just uh, answer them in any way you'd like. Um, so I'm going to start with Denise. Um, and the student asks, and, and sometimes I'll, I'll sort of adjust them a little bit, but the student noticed um, that there's a lot of earthy colors, such as browns, greens, yellows, black, red. And I was wondering where the inspiration came from um, that caused the artist to choose this particular color scheme. Was there a reason behind this, this, the patterning and the colors, or was it something that just sort of felt right in that moment? I think the, um, I was influenced a lot by the uh, colors in Mexico, and um, I felt like my palette was getting dreary uh, at home, and, and I wanted to use the colors that were around um, the streets in Mexico. I rely a lot on blue and yellow, uh, but black as a color um, as well, uh, because those seem to be most vital for me. And um, you know, and just hints of other colors, even though I might start out thinking I'm going to be very colorful, um, it is contro I'm controlled by black as a color. Okay. I think. Yeah, black is definitely evident in, in all or most of uh, Denise's work here, uh, particularly um, the, the black line work um, that we see on, on some of the paper images. Um, so I, I, it's, it's interesting that students picked up on that, and I, and it's, I think it's a good question. Uh, switching gears a little bit, David, what inspired um, or how were you inspired to use magazine pages and the use of the skeleton head? Um, does that revolve around your cultural background? <clears throat> no, not actually. 
The magazines, yes, because I think I, I like to use magazines that kind of refer back to my childhood. So I, I like Life magazine, for example, from the 1940s, you know, during the Second World War. And um, the skulls come from the uh, cut paper uh, pieces that they do in Mexico. So it's a reference, I think, to the Day of the Dead and um, the way that they use it. Okay. okay, to follow up um, on kind of the, the earlier question, Denise, um, a student commented, I love the hand drawing in your work. What do you like better, the line drawing or the backgrounds? The line drawing, I love the line drawing. I, I um, really um, get very um, intense, I think, with the uh, contour line and the pattern and the detail, but the backgrounds um, are very different. They are imposed um, in that they are photographic plots or they are um, uh, sidewalks that I've taken photographs of and digitally reproduced those. So those are already set and then I can impose my drawing on top of those or painting or um, the illustration of that. And it's um, you just get sucked into the line and the uh, form and the shape um, and trying to describe all the different details. So it's, the line I think is important, but I like the backgrounds. Yeah. <laughs> you know? So, I mean, to follow up on that student's question, um, you know, I love the line work too. It's just, it's just, it's very calligraphic. It's, it's, it's really exquisite, you know, in, in many places. And so I guess to, to kind of push the question a little bit more, um, is does the line work rely on the, the backgrounds to happen? In other words, um, what would it be like to do some of that line work just on white paper versus the background? And I did do some of that line work on the, uh, one, of, one of the pieces in the back there that was just a white um, piece of paper and that was at frightening at first because it wasn't scuffed up, it was pure white and so it took a while to get used to that surface. And um, it's just a different experience then. And, but you had to, it doesn't speak to you like the other ones do. Where when I look at the plots or the um, ghost images of, of some of the previous prints that I've made or the photographic um, streets, they, um, they talk to you also, you have a conversation with that ground. And so I had to steer the conversation with a blank piece of paper more than I would with the others. Okay, great, thank you. Uh, David, uh, um, for the larger uh, collage insula installation, is there a pattern or order to that? No, there isn't. I, I decided that um, I st about five years ago I, I had these little books on birds of America and I, I'm interested in bird imagery anyhow and I, I found that if I cut them apart and reassembled the, it made a little opening, a little window frame and I used that window frame to s select other images within that frame and then began to add other kinds of collage bits to that. That's how they sort of originated. And I have a kind of daily practice. I try to do like five a day. And uh, I started about five years ago, and I'm not sure what happened to some of the early ones. Uh, they've sort of disappeared, but there certainly are enough of them now, so I don't have to worry about that. Um, and each one is a kind of challenge, and I'm also interested in doing them in a kind of very immediate way. Sometimes if, if we're watching TV, for example, I'll, take, I'll just have pages from, from magazines and other kinds of things that I use for the collage, and I'll just cut things out and, and accumulate them. And then as I work on the pieces, I just add things to them in terms of size and shape and color and so forth. And um, each one is an individual thing. Uh, it doesn't have a particular message, although I am interested in, I've started to add sort of rubber stamp images to some of these, so I've collected a lot of rubber stamps I'm also interested in the idea of fake art. 
And I, some of these, you'll see that they actually have stamped on them fake art. Fake art. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, I, I, you touched on it a little bit, but um, the, the idea of process and that if you are, if you are um, repeating a process five times a day, um, you know, how do you, you said that each one is individual, and I, and I urge you to come look at this collage because you see that, in fact, they are very much individual, but how do you sort of, how do we as artists maybe, and Denise, if you want to chime in, but how, how do you prevent yourself from it becoming, you know, sort of formula driven and, and you know, having a kind of a pre-planned approach to everything we do? I think the images themselves kind of inspire certain kind of reactions. And I look at each one. You know, there was a technique that I use even as an undergraduate where we would cut out a piece of paper and you could move it over another composition until you found a, a new composition. And I kind of use that technique. I mean, I, I have images that I take out of magazines and I, I move the the little opening, the little window over that until I find something that really strikes me and then I use that. And then I just add things that seem to be uh, images that I just kind of enjoy. Mm -hmm. And when they come together, they create a new kind of uh, story. Mm -hmm. and, and I like that because I think each one has its own little story kind of going on. Thank you. So this next question was, um, was being asked of Denise, but I, I suppose you both could uh, chime in because you both were in Mexico. And it is, um, what part of studying in Mexico influenced your work the most? Well, we, we went to a residency called Archetopia in Puebla, Mexico in 2016 and 2017. And, um, and then we were invited back in 2019 to have a residency and then it would culminate in the show, which is what which this is. Which is what this work is, yeah. And um, so when we first went, when we first applied for that, there was, there was that interest of, you know, uh, being in a new place. We had been to Mexico before, but we hadn't been in Puebla. I hadn't been in Puebla. And um, in trying to see what, what you could expose yourself to. And in that residency, they, um, would, they would talk with us um, about our project, and they set up and arranged um, visits to the botanical gardens in the different towns and in Puebla itself. So we had that as a, a background um, with it. But the um, interest in Mexico started a long time ago for me when I was in undergraduate and we had um, different art history classes and that's when I was exposed to folk art mostly. And, um, and that was the most vivid um, for me and that was um, you know, important to me. So in this residency, when we found this residency in a, a newsletter um, for Archetopia, I thought that it would be a good uh, fit for us. And, um, and then it turned out to be a, an extraordinary uh, place for me to work. It um, allowed me to you know, eliminate all the mental clutter um, that you have at home and then just um, impose yourself on, in that setting mm -hmm. that it was, you know, like really, really good. Um, the, there are two directors, Christopher Davis and Francisco Guevara, and they are, um, they are magnificent in terms of creating a space that you um, can free yourself up and you can just work and mm -hmm. just concentrate on that. So it works for us. Not all residencies are the same, but this particular one works um, specially uh, for us. And we plan on going next year also um, in February to Archetopia Puebla. Wow, that's great. Uh, can I add something to that? Sure. I think that part of what happened to me is I tried to find some, some way to integrate an aspect of a Mexican culture into my work. Then I found the papel picado, which is the cut paper. The cut paper things that they cut them out of tissue paper and then they usually string them up across the room or across the street and you'll see them all over Mexico. It's a very traditional art form in Mexico. And I wanted to try to find a way 
to combine some things that I found there culturally into my work. And so I used, in, in, as you walk around the exhibit, you'll see many examples of where I've used parts of Papel Picado along with my collages. So I, I see it's sort of a marriage between those two things. And um, that was important to me, I think, to be there and to sort of absorb that part of the culture. And I, I just really enjoy being in Puebla, which is a large city. It has like three million people. But the area that we're in is the old section. Mm -hmm. So the buildings are older, it has more character. And we like walking around the central part, around the Zocalo. And um, we just, it's very comfortable to be there. And also, it, it just gives you full time on your work, you know, because they supply the meals and uh, you can really concentrate and just, you're not distracted with things that you are when you're at home. Well, well, I, um, I didn't realize it was that uh, large. Puebla is city. also famous for Baroque architecture, and that is um, also an element that we've included uh, mm -hmm. in our work, too. Um, so this next question uh, for David is um, related to this thing that happens where artists express themselves, they, they, they make art, and they, they, it's meant to be exhibited, and then often the artist is not around. In fact, almost the whole time the artist is not around and viewers come to view it. And so they, they have this sort of reaction as other humans would. So, th you know, you could sort of maybe play off that a little bit, but... Um, so for David, why are all the eyes, the eyes, the eyeballs blocked off in the piece titled Birds of a Feather, besides one pair, the pair that belongs to the child uh, holding the club soda? I think that that decision came about. I, I found that by covering the eyes, it sort of flattened out the shapes so they didn't become people looking back at you all the time. And, I, and it's something that was kind of interesting to me. And, and that's why I did that particular thing. It just seemed to make it more, it, it put the focus on the shape rather than the personality. I think when we look at a person, we look at their eyes, mm -hmm. and their eyes are our connection. So if you eliminate that, you look at the shape then, you know. Interesting. So yeah. that, was, that was the decision on that particular uh, choice. What was the other part of the question? There was another. Well, it just, um, that one of the eyes were not blocked oh, as a child. I, I, I don't know. I, Apparently, it didn't bother me. It's <laughs> <laughs> okay. a great answer, though. Um, so it's very, it's very sort of formal and, and optical and visual. I think in that case, it was. It was a formal decision, and it, it just seemed to, to kind of flatten out, like look at the shapes better rather than having the face there. You know, it, it's curious to me that when I look at these, now those images came from magazines from like the 1940s. Mm -hmm. and, uh, you recognize these people are probably no longer here. Mm -hmm. And I think that's kind of interesting to kind of revitalize these images. And, and I like the artwork that, that, that they made in those magazines. There are a lot of things that were hand drawn. Uh, the things you're referring to were actually photographs that were used in ads for mm -hmm. soup and cars or whatever they were advertising. And, uh, but that, that coloring and that tone of the paper and the fact that it survived you know, all these years. Um, I mean, it's almost 100 years old when you mm -hmm. think about it. If they're from 1940, well, it's 80 years old, I guess. So this next question, thank you, David. This next question for Denise is, um, I think about process, but it's also kind of personal and maybe even philosophical for artists. And it's a question I think that, that gets asked of artists often. But um, is your work planned out or do you find yourself making it up as you go along? I make it up as I go along. We call it spontaneity. Yeah. <laughs> I guess it sounds better, but um, but I don't I don't plan it out. And even if I do plan it out in my head, um, it oftentimes you know when I finish for the day, I look at it and it's like not where I thought I was going to go anyway. So it, it it's more like a travel, a journey, and a walk um, that. Um, uh, contributes to everything. So I don't do rough sketches. I do I do, do uh, some sketchbook drawings of shapes, you know, like small things, but they're not so you get used to or what you find is your pattern that you want to repeat. 
Um, but that's, that's about the only planning that I think I do. I, I think it's improvisation is the mm -hmm. word I like to use because in both of our works, I think we respond to the things that we have in front of us and, tr and let, it, let it happen. So you see something new and that's the fun for the artist. Philosophically, I believe that something that we make is not art until somebody else looks at it. I mean, that's really sort of how I, I look at mm -hmm. it. It doesn't become art, not just because I make it, but because somebody else has to look at it and then respond to it in some way. So uh, improvisation, I think, is... Yeah, I, I've there. used, to, with my students, I've used um, that art often is direct and purposeful, but it's also reactive, you know. So you, you set yourself off to make a piece of art, but you're, you're reacting to your own art. You know, you're, there's these unintended Absolutely, things that yeah. happen and happy accidents. I read an essay by Dubuffet a long time ago, and he talked about his process and that he had jars of specimens all around, I mean, even jars of materials like charcoal and paint and all around him so that you never knew what you know you were going to use. And, and I kept that image, although what didn't have a photograph, I had an image of that in my mind and that's how I maintain my studio practice, mm -hmm. I think, um, with all of these possibilities. Yeah, I can see that. Um, for David, um, there are a lot of pieces with what appears to be leaves and birds. Um, do these artworks connect in any way in terms of story or purpose? Yes, I've, I've been interested in birds for a long time. One of the things that I was interested in for a long time are bower birds, which have the same kind of spelling as my last name. And bower birds are found in Australia and New Guinea and they build, they actually build a little arch architectural structure and then they decorate it with blue objects and they really are very specific about getting blue berries or blue bottle caps or whatever they can find. And then the females come along and they sort of check out that little environment and if they like it they, they go into the little, it's not really a house, it's sort of arches, the bower part of it yeah. and they mate mm -hmm. and then they go off and and he rearranges stuff. They also steal from each other, which I thought was kind of interesting. Too. <laughs> and uh, so that's sort of, that's one of the interesting things that interests I've had, you know, in, in birds and uh, marvelous creatures. And we just watched a, a show on hummingbirds, and they're amazing. And yeah. we get hummingbirds in our garden. Yeah, we do too. I love them. I love watching yeah. them. Yeah. yeah. I, I'm becoming a bird person myself. So. <laughs> Um, so this last question is, uh, is pretty simple, but it's one that was asked by students, and it's, it's a good question. Is really just for the both of you, um, which, uh, what, what artwork are you most proud of? In this show? Yes. I think I would say that I, I like this ongoing collage thing I've got, and that allows me to kind of experiment every day and sort of participate in a, in a project that seems to have no end. As long as I can buy those little bird books on mm -hmm. eBay for a reasonable price, um, I would probably continue doing those. I mean, it's, it's part of my sort of being. It's, it's, it's autobiographical in a sense. It's also part of my practice that, that keeps me going sort of every day. Denise? I think I would pick the, um, the series that were on the plots mm -hmm. as, um, you know, that was, uh, that was, it, it, it started with the using these um, photographic plots of this area, actually, Joliet and Romeoville and the southern part of Illinois, and, um, and then it grew to the um, foot is looking at the streets or the sidewalks in Mexico and thinking that I could, I could use that and, um, instead of the Midwest um, also. Um, so, and, and the plots it allows me to combine painting as well as the um, drawing aspect of it. Whereas the uh, monoprints are just the, um, 
it can only be the monoprint for me. Uh, you know, like it, mm -hmm. it, it's hard to combine mm -hmm. the delicate drawing um, with that uh, aspect of it. So I think the plots, surfaces, those drawings, um, the hanging ones that are unframed as well as the framed ones are the ones that are significant. Well, thank you very much. Um, so first of all, thank you very much, uh, David and Denise, for the, the absolutely beautiful show. Um, we're really lucky to have it here. Um, as I mentioned earlier, David and Denise are retired uh, uh, college teachers. Um, and in, in higher education, we often talk about uh, people maybe going through college and then becoming lifelong learners. Um, and, and clearly, David and Denise are lifelong learners. Um, they, they put a, a, an immense amount of time and energy and thought uh, into their work. As a matter of fact, they're getting ready to go back uh, down to Mexico as soon as they're able. Uh, and um, just more proof of that, of that commitment um, to, to something that they hold so dearly. Um, and it's, it's absolutely evident when you come into this gallery. So um, for those of you who are able to, you have to get in and look at this show. So thank you very much, David and You're Denise. Welcome. Thank you for the opportunity to um, show at, the, at Lewis. I mean, we really like being in a college environment, and we really enjoy and appreciate the questions that the students um, took time to prepare for us and, and taking time to look at the show. Very good. Well, stay safe. Thank you, and take care. Thank you. So this piece um, entitled uh, Puebla Stone Jaunt is uh, started out with a photograph of the sidewalk that um, had confetti and rose petals um, sprinkled on it in the broken sidewalk. And so it, we walked over it, and I walked over you know, maybe three times, and then I thought, well, when are you going to take a picture of this? So I, I took a picture, I had it digitally reproduced in this uh, format on this paper. And then I worked with um, different plants and materials and uh, a stamp and a grid pattern and tried to focus on the cracks of the sidewalk as well as the patterns I was imposing on top of it. So there's the repeat patterns of the um, different uh, leaves that were uh, that I had on a fig leaf and uh, a little a small leaf from a popcorn plant and a cabbage leaf um, that I worked with um, throughout it. And one of the parts of the um, sidewalk uh, image had a cigarette butt and different grasses. And so I, I had to um, I wanted to incorporate shapes, not necessarily a cigarette, but the color and the shapes that would sprinkle around it so that you would look at that. And in some cases, I like the play between the photographic image as well as the um, drawing and painting that I put onto it so that it has that layering effect. And so the grid pattern and the, the um, uh, line work that uh, repeats the patterns in the cracks of the uh, concrete. This piece started out um, on a, uh, a sheet, uh, it's a ghost image of a print that I had done before. And then I had a, um, a cabbage leaf that I re uh, drew three times in that area and then some other kind of plant forms, orchids uh, that I had um, saved or uh, had flattened out. And the um, cabbage leaf was also um, saved for me from my sister-in-law and brother-in-law in Wisconsin from their garden. They had this, they sent me all these um, pressed leaves and one of them was this fantastic um, cabbage leaf. So I used that in the, um, in the composition and tried to really focus on contour line drawing more. The colors, the red, the um, beige color and the uh, grayish blue color were part of the oil um, uh, ink from the print, from the mono print that I had. And then I just worked on top of that with red marker and black uh, marker and contour line. So this one really focuses on the contour line. This one focuses on the, the idea of the backgrounds as well as the um, uh, 
uh, shapes that I put on top of it. And then the other piece that is in this room that is a little different in terms of technique and, and thought process is the uh, monoprint um, that I have here. It's three pieces that are um, put together to make one large uh, monoprint. And in this case, and it was done at the same time in Mexico with the same idea. I cleaned off my table and I just started out with the images and different stencils that I had. So there are a lot of color lilies around the studio space. So I had a, an image of the color lily uh, as a stencil and I repeated that over and over again. I had a piece of linoleum block that I just cut out um, different images and tried to repeat that in the um, different stages and uh, as well as some of the other stencil pieces that I could um, impose onto that background. I liked this way of working as a, uh, a, a, a different style because it allowed you to, to breathe and to you know, spread about and it wasn't quite as tight as the um, drawings, so the contour line drawings uh, could, uh, could work with. And this developed with more textures and more interest in terms of the shapes and larger shapes and colors that were around me um, in the environment. I wanted to start with some of the earlier pieces that I did in Mexico. I would found these old magazines, the Life magazine, it's, of course, it's in Spanish from 1961, I guess. And at, at first look, you see Fidel Castro's face. But actually, if you look closer, and, and, and maybe even at the shadow, you see that the papel picado, which is the cut paper, is, is also there. So you have a, this image that, if, and I find if you squint, too, it helps. I don't know what the camera's going to do to this, but for example, here's a skull with the eyes and there's a nose, and uh, the shadow reveals it better if you, you get around it. Maybe if I raise that up a little bit, you can get under there and see that it makes that shadow. And that's, what, that's sort of where the idea started for the, for the pieces I did in Mexico. In this one, I combined the papel picado, which is the cut paper. You see that there's a skeletal face there and a bird here. And then these little collages I use on the side. And what we did is we had these blown up onto paper and to vinyl. So over in the other corner is the uh, larger version of this. And they have, uh, it's, it's relatively inexpensive in Mexico to have these things blown up. And then I uh, recut the paper with the same design in it. And um, since we've been back, I've had these framed so they could ship them uh, as paper. It became a lot easier. Uh, let's look at this one over here, because I think, I think in the works that were in the show, again, I think it's very evident of the, of the paper birds cut out here. And uh, someone had mentioned about the eyes being covered. And I think you see that it really kind of uh, flattens out or makes them easier to look at. They're not looking back at you. And uh, so that was the impetus there. And all of the uh, background stuff here are from the, from the little bird books, you know, these identification books. So occasionally you'll see that. And this, of course, is the writing from that and the various names of those things. And you'd think by now that I'd, I'd be really familiar with all the birds in the United States, but it's a slow process. So, and then if we want to look at this one real quick. Uh, the, when I make these, I make the paper first. And so I had these small collages on either side, which is the same as that one in the corner. And then, uh, it was blown up and then I recut it. So we see the, the skeletal figure reading or working on a computer. And uh, I, I really like the idea of combining sort of my culture and the things that I brought to Mexico with the things that I found there, which are the papel picado. And the whole idea of the sort of skeletal figure is kind of interesting. The one in the other corner 
uh, we can even see it from here, is um, a larger piece. And I think the, the uh, and I like the fact that they hung them off the wall so we get this sort of cast shadow. I, I think that really makes the things have a, a kind of depth that I like. Um, and this is, I think, is the largest of the pieces that I had done there. Again, it's a blow up of one of the smaller collages, <clears throat> and then I recut it. So 